you realize that I'm probably the oldest speaker in the conference. I'm going to speak about a very old protocol, DNS. The D stands for dinosaur, so this is Jurassic Park, actually. Uh, yet I'm, uh, I'm going to make, uh, well, we're we going to have some fun moments in this presentation as well. Uh, as introduced, I'm full-time employed by a company in Belgium named Telenet for Business. Though I'm not here uh, with that hat, I, I'm also allowed to do uh, uh, part-time free, freelance consultant. And as freelance consultant, I mostly uh, spend time uh, teaching, well, teaching, presenting for schools, high school students, and uh, conferences like this. I, I don't do this for profit, I do this for fun and, and pleasure, and I like to share my uh, experience with you. So, talking about what I'm going to share, uh, this is the, the agenda of today, of, of this presentation. I'm first going to introduce uh, some mini or a small amount of theory around DNS, uh, sufficient for you to understand uh, two, uh, two approaches to DNS. One is uh, about this forwarding to an external name server. So why is forwarding to an external name server, why is it actually uh, dangerous? And uh, we, we need some theory about that. And the second half of the presentation, and it's the largest half, is about a, a, a different use of the DNS protocol. So I'm going to, to make the point that DNS is actually a connectionless transport protocol. And if you add uh, another, or if you define your own session layer and your own presentation layer, you can actually do very uh, different things with DNS. And we are going to focus on file transfer. So we're going to transfer files in and out via DNS. But I also show you how to mitigate this. So what can you do against this? About uh, theory um, and terminology, the, when we talk about name server, uh, you should realize that there are different flavors of name servers. And the first flavor I would like to point out is the authoritative name server. An authoritative name server is a name server who knows the content of his own file. He doesn't have to ask anybody. He simply knows because it's in a local file or like in Windows, it may be in a Windows in the registry of, of Active Directory, an integrated or an AD integrated uh, zone file. So an authoritative name server doesn't have to ask anybody, he simply knows the content. And there are two flavors of authoritative name service. You have the primary or master, and he has the, the read-write copy. If you have to do a change to a zone, you, you do the change on the, on the primary name server. And the slaves, they also have a copy, but the copy is read-only. So don't do a change on the slave name server. The, the authoritative name servers are the ones on, on one side of the communication. They, they provide the content to this huge distributed worldwide database. And what's sometimes confusing for customers or for, for people is that the other side, the, the, the side that asks questions, is also called name server. Uh, there you have the caching name server. Caching name server uh, doesn't know content. The only thing it knows is about where are the root name servers? Where, where do I start? And the forwarding name server, well, actually even knows less. The forwarding name server only knows uh, which caching name server can I address to get replies? So he only sends queries in one direction. And the customers or the customer programs, th this is called the stub resolver. This is a, a library in the application. And the library in the application, it, it asks questions to the, to the caching or the forwarding name server. Now, uh, about terminology, again, uh, what's a domain name? And, and the, the main part, well, we have, we have labels. A, a, a domain name is composed out of label, and then there is a separator between two labels, which is the dot. There's still 
chairs available here in the front or there on the right side. Uh, so label dot label dot label. The label is a uh, the dot is a separator between labels. Uh, we say that the domain name is fully qualified if it terminates in a, in a dot itself. So the trailing dot is a fully qualified domain name. It is actually followed by the so-called empty label. There is a label behind it, but it has no characters. We call this the root domain, the root zone. Now, later on, what's important, there's still room here on the right side as well, uh, uh, what is important for later on in this, in this presentation is that the label may be maximally 63 characters long, and the total domain name must be uh, less than or equal to 255 characters. We, we are going to need that later on. Uh, a DNS record uh, has kind of five fields. Uh, it has a domain name, which is the, the key to the... The, the research key uh, to, to find this uh, record. Uh, time to live is how long can a caching and forwarding name server, how long can they remember this, uh, uh, this record once they, they learn it themselves. There is a class, and we only stick to the IN class, stands for internet class. And then we have a resource record type and type specific data. Uh, some resource records have several fields, other, ha other have only uh, one field. A couple of examples, the NS record, the name server record. Name server record is one that delegates uh, authority to another name server. So what you see here at the bottom is that Lampo, that's net, netsec.eu, which, which is my domain, uh, is delegated towards two name servers, and there's the name of those name servers. Uh, the name server records, they are important for the structure of the distributed uh, database. And then we have, which we'll come back to later on as well, and uh, the A and the Quad A records. The A record represents an IPv4 address, and the Quad A record represents an IPv6 address. So you have the example, uh, we have one A record for this name, and we have a quad A record, and you see the IPv6 address. As IPv6 addresses are four times longer than IPv4 addresses, we have 16 bytes. So in the A record, we have four bytes to put our data in later on, and in the quad A record, we have 16 bytes. We'll make use of this, this length as well. Now, how does this work? How does this operate in practice? Uh, we have on the upper, we have on the top side there, we have the client with the built-in stub resolver. And if it asks a question or when there's a, a person who wants to browse somewhere, the stub resolver sends it to, for instance, a forwarding name server. The forwarding name server is the one who doesn't know anything except where to ask, where to send his <coughs> query to. So the forwarding name server sends it to the caching name server. And the caching name server initially knows nothing except where are the root name servers. So he asks the question to the root name server. Now the root name server gets this question about lamponetsec.eu and he says, I don't know. There are zero answers in that reply, but there is an NS record. He says, I don't know, but ask them. And them are the... Uh, authoritative name servers for, uh, for .eu. So the caching name server learning this knows that he has to go elsewhere and he goes to an authoritative name server of .eu asking about lamponetsec.eu again and he gets a I don't know message again. But EU gives a delegation message towards the authoritative name server of lamponetsec.eu so finally here's the answer. This is basically how DNS works. Now the next step uh, I'm going into is uh, between this forwarding and this caching name server, forwarding caching name server. Uh, if you do it like that and you put your cache, uh, you can put your caching name server in your local DMZ, so locally under your control of the organization and you have a caching name server in your DMZ and uh, you're forwarding or for instance on the internal network. Uh, on the other hand, it's also possible that some companies have decided to put, to say, I forward to an external name server. 
I choose my ISP. I choose Google, 8.8.8.8. .8 I choose Open Resolver, and I forward to them. Now, there is a risk in that. And the risk is actually uh, for cash poisoning. Uh, a couple of years ago, we have had Dan Kaminsky explaining how to do or an approach to the cash poisoning of a name server. Now, one of the problems, I would say, with the Dan Kaminsky approach to cash poisoning is that the, 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 the window frame, the time during which the name server is actually vulnerable to receiving and believing a, a faked answer is rather small. So there were a couple of solutions have been uh, suggested, and, and one of the solutions, well, they are, uh, they are here uh, on the slide, but uh, one of the solutions has also been, uh, look, why don't you forward to an external name server that is patched? And effectively, if you did that, and you ran the test uh, on, on his website, you saw that your own name server was apparently no longer vulnerable to the Dan Kaminsky uh, fa flavor of cash poisoning. But when you forward to an external name server, you open a new can of worms, which I'm going to introduce. Now, look first here. Uh, I have this uh, client uh, in the bottom, client in the bottom, and his uh, external uh, patched caching DNS server, patched against the Dan Kaminsky way of cash poisoning. Now, the name server or the, the client wants to go to, go to Hotmail and he sends a query, www.hotmail.com. This caching name server goes out. He asks and he gets the reply, oh, www.hotmail.com is actually a C name. It's an alias name and it refers to mail.live.com. Now, observe that in this answer, there is no address record. If there were an address record, this patched a caching name server would have to refuse it because the name servers that are authoritative for Hotmail are not authoritative for Live.com. So if the caching name server receives this answer, he has actually to go out again to the root, to com, and then to Live.com in order to learn the IP address of mail.live.com. And now he combines those two answers and replies to the client. And he now says, dear client, you asked for www.hotmail.com. It's actually an alias to mail.live.com. And mail.live.com has an A record, which is the IP address. Uh, in DNS terms, the, 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 the caching name server, the, the top one, he cannot uh, accept an answer here. He cannot an answer here because of an A record because of a difficult term which is called in bailiwick. In DNS we say in bailiwick because the, the answer that would come from the hotmail.com authoritative name servers, they, they, since they are not authoritative for live.com, it would be out of their scope, out of their, uh, their area of, of, of competence. So they are not in bailiwick. Now, the caching name server here, this one, does not accept that kind of reply, but observe that here it does. Because there's only one query sent, and the query must res resolve, must lead to an, I an IP address. So this client, uh, must, or the reply to the client, must, be, uh, must hold both records. So there is no in bailiwick protection for the, the client. Uh, so here again, this is a detail. Now what we actually do if we forward to an external name server, the forwarding name server also asks only one question. So our forwarding mail server in the company uh, network loses the in bailiwick protection. Now how can an attacker make use of that? Because when an, when an attacker now knows that it is possible to, to get spoofed answers to, the, to this name server, he still has to do fulfill a number of requirements. Namely, uh, well, uh, is this difficult or not? Uh, so 
the, the, name, the, the attacker has to spoof with the source IP of the name server where uh, the caching, the, in, the forwarding name server here, he is expecting an answer for them. So he has to spoof with that IP address. How can he know that IP address? He, uh, the answer should be sent to the forwarding name server. So he should spoof and send the reply to that name server. So how can an attacker know that this IP address has asked a question to that one and that now is the moment to start spoofing? Uh, he has to know what reply or what question has been asked. He has to know the identifier. So every query holds a 16-bit identifier. The, query, the, the attacker has to guess that, so he has to try a number of times. And uh, as with Dan Kaminsky, the reply, the spoofed reply, must make it to the names, to the forwarding name server before uh, his reply must make it to that name server before he replies. So how can he be so fast in order to achieve that call? And I'm going to explain that actually it's, uh, in theory, it's doable. Uh, the first thing is how can the attacker know what IP address to spoof with. And uh, actually, what, what you can do, or what an attacker can do if he wants to achieve this goal, is launch some malware on PCs, and the malware asks a, a, a rather special, well, special, it, it asks a DNS question, and in the DNS question it says, I'm going to query for like 4.2.2.2, and then the attacker domain. So the attacker domain is, leading to a domain name server, an authoritative name server under control of the attacker. And the 4.2.2.2 is actually the IP address where this malware sends the query to. So the malware sends a query to that IP address, and the attacker in his name server, he sees in the query log, he sees a query from that IP address. And he remembers that. So the attacker makes a table and he says, if I see a query coming from that IP address, I have to spoof with that IP address. If open resolver, uh, this is an open resolver IP address, if I see a query coming from that IP address, sorry, this is the open resolver IP address, so if I see a query coming from that IP address, I have to spoof with that IP address. So it simply creates a table with Two IP addresses. I see a query coming from, then I use this IP address to spoof. So the first question, I think, is solved. The next thing is that uh, you, you have to know where to send the IP address to. Now, in a lot of cases, the client is behind a firewall, and there are a lot of customers who do hiding nut and who hide every tra all traffic behind one IP address. So if the attacker can trick a, uh, a client to come to his website and he notes the IP address where the, the, the name comes, the, 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 where the client comes from, actually he already, you give away your IP address to the attacker. So what the website now can do, uh, uh, since he now knows what IP address you come from, what the, attack, what the attacker website can do is give you an, a URL in the HTTP stream, it says I a redirect or go and fetch, and it gives you a new domain name which you have to resolve. And the new domain name looks like this. So the attacker now sends a, a, a redirect to victim.public.ip, so the public IP where he sees your HTTP query come from, the source port where he sees the, the query come from, and the attacker domain. So the attacker domain, this, when this query is then performed, when this query is then performed, you actually uh, forward or your, caching, your forwarding name server internally forwards to this external one, and the external one goes to the hacker DNS server. So there he is, he sees victim, the public IP of the victim, the port number where to start, uh, which is often used in, in net translation, so you start from that port on, and you bring it back to the attacker domain. So now he can start to spoof, because he sees where the IP address comes from, and he has his table. I see a query coming from, so I do the spoofing. So he starts to spoof. And he says, what you are asking me is actually a C name, an alternative name for www, like visa.com, visa something financial. 
And by the way, since you don't have in bailiwick protection, I'm going to give you the IP address as well. So he's trying to cash poison www.visa.com. And he has to do it several times because he may, have, he may need several guesses for the identifier. Now, how long was the window of opportunity? And Dan Kaminsky, the, 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 the faked or the spoofed message must make, must make it before the real message comes from the authoritative name server. And that is, in most cases, less than 100 milliseconds. Here, we are talking in the range of seconds. Why? Because you asked the query, the DNS query, to the attacker DNS server. And the attacker DNS server may choose not to answer. So as long as the attacker name server does not answer to him, he will not answer to you. So he can keep the window open for a certain amount of time. So before uh, he gives up and says there is no reply, he simply sends a new query. He sends a new query which looks almost the same. And uh, if you ask, if you follow that, there you get an A record. But the A record bring you back, brings you back to the, to the attacker website. So the A record would bring you back to his website and you would get another URL and he can retry for a couple of seconds. So uh, when is the attack successful? Well, if you don't return. So if he, after two seconds, he said, uh, I'm going to answer to this caching name server uh, with an IP address that brings you back to my web server, and, but you don't come back to his web server, then obviously uh, you already knew what, you already believed the spoofed answer. So, in, in theory, I think everything is there. It needs some work. You need some, uh, to set up this table, uh, you need a web server that communicates with uh, the authoritative name server of the attacker domain. But I think if you forward to an external name server, uh, an external caching name server, you, you actually give away a lot of control over your DNS flow. I have some recommendations for this. Uh, one thing is, uh, the attack is made possible. Be one assumption is that the HTTP queries and the DNS queries come from the same IP address. So if you have sufficient IP addresses in your infrastructure, make sure that your DNS queries are differently translated than your HTTP queries. That's a minimum that you could do. Uh, even don't use the IP address for DNS queries. Don't use it for anything else but for DNS queries. Uh, and also, the internal uh, name server, I would recommend to do DNSSEC validation. Uh, but they also have to give the message to the other side, the authoritative name servers, that please start, doing ad start adding DNSSEC signatures, uh, because there's no point in doing DNSSEC validation if you don't provide signatures to, to validate. So DNSSEC should be a bit more popular in, in the world. So this is uh, how, how you can, how by, by arranging your DNS flow, so I, I don't recommend to, to, to forward to an external name server. I hope nobody from Google is in the room because it's a bit against their, uh, their goal. But uh, for, for residential customers, it's okay. That, that's not a problem. For companies, don't forward. The I switch back to, to the other one now. Uh, the other uh, thing, an, an alternative use of the DNS protocol. If I ask people, my customers, where I give consultancy, when I ask them, what is DNS? They say, oh, DNS, that's, uh, that's the, the protocol that translates names into IP addresses, like www.hackactivity.com is translated into this IP address. And, and also it's uh, used to give, uh, to indicate where mail should be sent to with the MX records. And DNS can also translate an IP address to a name. Uh, so uh, the IP address of the web server of activity.com actually resolves to something at uh, hosting.ad.park.hu. So now you know where they are customer for their website. Uh, so this is, the, this is what DNS has been built for initially, back in the early 80s. But if you actually look 
at the DNS protocol. And you, you, you take aware this first observation. DNS actually creates a communication path between the red device on the left and the authoritative name server of the goal domain at the right. And it's actually a connectionless transport protocol. Uh, it's connectionless because there's no connection set up. You send a query and you get a reply and you can send data. Where is the data? It's in your query. You have labels. And where is the reply of the name server? Well, there may not be a reply necessary. I have some examples on that. But if there is a reply, well, it's in the DNS reply in the type-specific data of the record you have asked for. Now, it is sufficient to add, uh, oh, I, this is already used. I have an example here. It's an it's almost unreadable query. Uh, but look at the end of the, of the, of the domain name, uh, mcafee.com. Uh, this is probably a McAfee client on a PC that scanned or that has to verify if some file is, uh, is, is vulnerable or, or some file is indeed a virus or, or, or something malware. So he asked kind of for help. He asked the, uh, the uh, McAfee database. He does some formatting, uh, which is a presentation layer, and the question is being sent. Now, the reply could be from McAfee, I don't know, meaning that, well, we don't know if this file is, 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 is malware or not a virus or not. Uh, or uh, it could be the, the, the reply is 127.001, could mean that this is a virus. If it is 172.002, this could mean it is a malware. I don't know, I'm just guessing. But the, the principle is that the DNS query holds the data. And the DNS reply holds the data. So if there is an IP address in the reply, there will be no communication afterwards to that IP address. Simply, this is the IP address is already a, a, a no or a yes or a, an I don't know, but it's, only, it's the only thing that's needed. Same thing, uh, other example are the, the blacklist for email. You, mail server receives an email from some source IP and it queries a blacklist. If there is no such domain, the IP address sending the mail is not known to be a spammer. It's the same principle. DNS is used to transport the data. Which brings me, uh, okay. So in summary, DNS, is, uh, DNS forwarding and caching name servers, they, they act like transport layer routers, if you'll forgive me the word, because routers are something on layer three and transport is layer four. And, and a normal DNS delegation brings them to the right name server, the, the attacker name server. So uh, as a matter of fact, there is no need for the client to have DNS access to the internet. Uh, if there are forwarders and, and caching name servers that, that do the thing for you, it's, it's okay. You don't have to have direct internet access or direct DNS access. And we still respect the DNS protocol. We don't, we don't do SSH over port 53. No, no, these are normal DNS queries. So firewalls, intrusion detection systems, they don't see anything. This is DNS. So it's only a matter of defining a presentation and a session layer, and, and we'll start uh, with something simple. We start with just taking time. Uh, we start with something simple. Here it is. Uh, suppose that some malware is capable of launching a, uh, a DNS query, and the DNS query something, some, uh, looks like my.secret.competitor.toplevel domain. So some malware in your network discovered something, something worth to export, and the malware says, I'm going to export it over DNS. So it writes the secret, maybe clear text in this case, and your secret ends up in the query log of the competitor name server. Presentation layer is simple, clear text in the label, 
label cannot be longer than 63 characters and the name, total name, not longer than 255 characters. And uh, the, the query, what do you query for? A record, what A record, whatever, don't care. Whatever is queried for, it's in the query log of the other server. Do you care about the reply? Actually, no, I don't care about the reply. Simply being able to send the DNS query is sufficient for exporting your, uh, your secret. Think about a, a program that does password guessing that has been left in your network, and each time it finds a valid login, it sends out a password via DNS. Actually, uh, we can try this. Uh, please uh, use a mobile phone or so and, and perform a query. Uh, you can either do an, an NS lookup query or, or, or do an HTTP. So open a browser, HTTP dot colon colon or Slash, and, and then put some text and terminate it in .secret .dns l 4 p is a domain name I just created last month, uh, DNS layer 4 protocol .be. If you do that kind of query, we're going to find it because I'm switching to my name server. This is a, a unique server in, in France, actually, where my registrar is. And if some of you have typed in some secret, I will find the secrets in the name server log, in the query log of that name server. Don't know if somebody has done it, so let's show, show secrets. Nobody yet, but I did one this morning uh, when I checked it up. Couldn't sleep very well, so at 7.10 I was already checking this. Uh, what you see is that I send a query, good morning, uh, activity 2014, dot secret dot dns l 4 p dot be and the query ended up in the query log. Now what you see in the presentation layer or in terms of presentation layer, because that name server actually refuses to answer, the, 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 the caching name server asks the query multiple times. But every time it sends the query, the secret ends up again in the query log. So this is in terms of presentation layer. On the client side, nothing has to be done. But on the, on the server side, you have to get rid of the duplicates. Uh, so I provided a minus D option. And with minus D, I get rid of the duplicates. And you see all the secrets uh, turning up in the, uh, in the query log of the other system. Switch back. So let's go to a somewhat more elaborate uh, presentation layer. I'm going to use the A records now. So uh, there are a couple of possibilities. A records, we have four bytes. Quad A records, 16 bytes. Uh, the others I have some, I come back to later in the presentation. Uh, the A record and the quad A records are binary data. Uh, you can put anything you want in there. So, uh, what is binary data for the DNS protocol can be text for another. What is text for the DNS protocol can be encoded for the, the application. Uh, what I'm going to do is file transfer. I'm going to file transfer a file into a network simply using DNS. So the presentation looks like the following. I have A records, four bytes, and every byte uh, represents the ASCII uh, representation of a character. So uh, the capital, or if you take the last of the four, which is a white space, white space is hexadecimal 20, is decimal 32. So an IP address like 84.104.101.32, well, actually, for this application, the 32 is a blank. Uh, the session layer, well, the file may be longer than four bytes, so we will have to do multiple queries. And what we actually do is prepend a sequence number. So if I ask for 0.filename, I get the first four bytes. If I ask for 1.filename, I get the second four bytes, which leads to this. And I'm doing this. I'm, uh, I have a script. Actually, I can switch also back. Well, the file is already there, as you see, but so I'm asking for 
Fox and Doc, Doc, Fox and Doc dot text. And you see it sends out 12 queries uh, from 0 to 10. The 11th query yields no such domain. And this no such domain means we have reached the end of the file. And then the script composes all characters, brings them together, prints them out. So the quick brown fox jumps over a lazy dog, which is printed as, as the DNS queries come in, as the DNS replies come in, sorry. And then the script does a cat of the file. Why I do it twice, you will see in a minute. So uh, I can tra file transfer. This fully respect. I did only queries for A records. And this fully respects the, the DNS protocol. And in is my file. Uh, this works also for quad A records, fox and doc.txt. Since quad A records hold 16 bytes per quad A record, I need less queries, so it's more efficient. So three queries yield a result, and the fourth query, no such domain. Now there is a little more presentation layer in here. Uh, you see that every uh, IPv6 address starts with a two, which is deliberate. Uh, in IPv6, we have plenty of IP addresses, and actually uh, public, valid public IPv6 addresses start with 2,000 or 3,000. So if I would put something else, if I would put a 4 or a 5 or a 6, uh, like, like a character could be, uh, character encoding could yield this, I would have a, an, an IP address, a quad A record, which starts with 6,000. Now, if there is some IDS, it could say, an IPv6 address starting with 6,000, this is not valid. I'm going to raise an alarm. So here I chose to put to, to result only in valid uh, uh, IPv6 addresses. And the second character, you see three times an F, and this is actually counter. F stands for 15. And the last, uh, sorry, two times F, and the last is a C. Hexadecimal C is 10. So in the last quad A record, there are 10 characters. And in the two first, there are 15 characters. This is only a matter of presentation. You can, you can alter this. You can, you can say, I want to distribute evenly and have three times a, a C or a D, three times 14 characters. Uh, so it's, it's only presentation. You're in control. And the, 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 the scaring thing is that this also works for viruses. Oh, and that I did on the wrong computer. I'm sorry about this. Um, uh, I have to do it here. This is on my portable. Uh, because if I do it here, demo effect. Hmm. Bear with me a second. <laughs> so here is iCar on my PC. It uh, downloads. As it receives A records, it pushes them out, and the antivirus scanner doesn't react. And that's why I do it twice, I do a cat, because while I'm getting them, the four bytes per four bytes are put in a file, and it's only when I open the file that my virus scanner reacts. So imagine that your employer, your company has put antivirus systems, plural, in the DMZ, uh, trying to catch all viruses via proxy. Uh, you have an, a next generation firewall with antivirus and things like that. It doesn't react. It only reacts once the file is here. And it also works for, of course, quad A records. Same thing. Back to my presentation. Oh, there's the virus scanner. Okay. I think at Telenet they look at me suspiciously when they see the locks that I download so many viruses. Uh, anyway. Good, uh, we've seen this, 12 queries, there it comes. Uh, I've explained about the two, why I put the two, and the F, four queries are needed, and this also downloads the virus scanners, so only six queries. I think we can jump to the conclusion, uh, the two, the number of characters, the data itself, it's only presentation layer. 
If they found out, if they have detection mechanism to see an alert, is oh, change your presentation layer. In summary, it is possible to download files via DNS. Otherwise said, malware can download new malware. Malware can download updates of itself. Presentation and session layer are yours to define. You want to add a byte counter to the A record? Be my guest. You don't want to put a two in the front? Be my guest. You want to use a different record, text record, for instance, but I come back to text records later. So be my guest. It's, you're in control. Uh, what's the use of being able to download if you can't upload your results? You can. It works. It's only a matter of presentation layer. The presentation and session layer are a bit more complicated. Uh, uh, if your authoritative name server on the other side, if you have two or three authoritative name servers, different ones, and then you have more query logs, it's easy, secure shell or secure copy the query logs all together, do a sort so that you have only one query log and look for your files in that single query log. So how does the does it look like in the presentation layer? What we are going to do is that uh, every query, uh, I, I'm going to put one, use one label, only one label per query, and only one label has a, or one label that has content of the file. Since a label cannot be longer than 63 characters, since a file can hold white space, new line characters, it could be binary, a Microsoft Word or Excel document. <coughs> Uh, what you're going to do is, is transform it into something that fits nicely into DNS, and we are using base64 in this case, with the argument w63, telling it that it should produce words no longer than 63 characters, and a list of them. So, an example, this is my text, we convert it with base64, and it says I have two lines come out of it, and those will be the labels that I sent to the that I use in the, in the queries. Now, most probably we need multiple queries to send the file. Uh, even the short text is two queries, so we have to, we, we have to include the serial number. Uh, it is possible that, uh, that your malware is so successful that multiple files are being uploaded simultaneously, so we're going to have some kind of a session number to distinguish between the different uploads. And uh, there's still the question about how does, on the server side, how do you know that the file is complete? We need a kind of end of file indication on the server side. Uh, when we download the file, it was easy. Uh, I, we had declared if the query yields no such domain, we have reached end of file. But of course, on, towards the other side, uh, is, there is no, no such domain towards the server. So did the last query make it to the server or not? So, there are two options, well, I saw two options. One is to announce a file and say, here, I'm going to upload a file, and I'm going to upload it in, in 10 parts. Uh, alternatively, uh, it is possible to, to add an extra query and to say, well, we're done. So I chose for the first option, I'm going to announce the file. And here is the announcement. So the script is called upload. Uh, in this case, it's a doc, a, Win a Windows Mic a Microsoft Word document, and the first query is shown, and it says upload, and it's actually announcement. I'm, I'm going to upload using session number 1380. The document is DNS upload docx, and there are 216 queries. And here's the first one. So I start with the sequence number one, and then you have the label, which I a bit shortened, but the first label is 63 characters long, and it's being uploaded, uh, well, there's a full DNS name. So query one goes out, query two goes out, up till 216, and query 216 has only, in this case, a short uh, label, A, uh, well, it's only, it's, it's only text. It's the result of this base 64. Now, all those queries go out, and they arrive in the query log of the, on the other side. Uh, remember, they could be duplicated because they could be resent by some caching name server. Uh, we have to get rid of the duplicates then. So in the query log, you see this. Actually, it's the same. Uh, you see the upload. Uh, the, the file is announced. And then we have 1 to 216. And uh, well, it's all in the query log. And finally, we have a script that reads the query log. 
and this script uh, outputs some results. It says, uh, I, I got an announcement, the first line there, I, is, I, I got an announcement for a file of 216 lines. The second line says, I was expecting 216 lines and I found 216 lines, so it's okay. And the third line says, here's the document. And the document is 10,000 characters big. Okay. Well, shall we try this? Don't believe me. Never trust your security consultant, I say. Uh, so, uh, let's say VI activity 2014. Give me some text. Somebody a suggestion. I want some words. Somebody text. Hello world. Very predictable. <laughs> okay. Something? Some text. Temperature outside is how much? 23, 24, 25? 25? Good. Others? I heard 24. Oh, it's only 42. <laughs> that must be far and I know. Okay. Good. Date. Uh, I can't predict this, can I? Uh, and I need some characters. Oh. This is to, to get some <coughs> content. Oh, this is not what I wanted. Sorry about that. Damn. So the file is there, activity 2014. Let's send it. Uh, we check. Okay. Upload activity 2014. Ah, sorry. Now it's there. Two minutes. No good. My goodness. I didn't see it. Can you come again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about this. Uh, Are you distracted? Sorry? Yes, yeah, um, uh, I can draw the conclusion. Uh, it, it is, believe me, it's possible to upload files. So malware can send interesting files to the to the internet. Um, presentation and session layer are yours to define. So shorter labels, uh, you can encrypt the file. You, you are in control. You want just how you want to hide it. Uh, DNS tunneling, I'm, I'm going a bit to skip this, uh, because this is all, DNS tunneling is, is encapsulating IP or TCP over DNS. It's, it's actually a very old argument. Uh, in 2014, there was a talk here at activity of Gabor Yene about uh, uh, getting out of paying Wi-Fi networks. So if you have to pay for the, for the, for the Wi-Fi, you can tunnel over DNS and get out of it. So, but this is actually more of the same. This is using DNS as a transport layer protocol. But what should, should be clear is that DNS, or that, that uh, this is not, this technique is not limited to Wi-Fi networks where you have to pay. This, this works in, 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 in your business networks as well. And you don't need a special name server. In case of DNS tunneling, the, the, the query results in the reply, and the name server has to build the reply on the fly. So the name server is aware about that presentation and session layer. But what I demonstrate with file downloading and uploading, if that would have worked, it's a normal DNS server. OK? I'm going to skip a couple of things. There will be in the download. There's one thing. How do you defend against this? And allow me, this is the, the most important of the, of, the, of the presentation, or at least this part. 
How can you defend against this kind of abuse? And it is by cutting the line between internal DNS and external DNS. So you deploy internal root name servers. And your step resolver goes to the caching name server. Your caching name server goes to the internal root name server. And the internal root server can delegate towards internal others, uh, like Windows AD servers for Windows AD and things like that. But the point is that no query can be sent by a PC and no query can be sent out to the internet. The only ones that can go out are those that are in the DMZ. So in the DMZ, there is a caching name server, and he goes to the public route. Then this has a number of consequences. The, the consequence is that uh, uh, since nothing can escape, so no file upload, no leakage of secrets, no file download, nothing, nothing works of that. The, the other part is that uh, the only way that an internal host can get out is via a, a, a server in the DMZ. There's no direct way out. So how can you get out is via, for instance, a proxy. The, the, the browser must use an explicit proxy. The explicit proxy queries the, D, the DNS structure to find where is the proxy in the internal network. It then addresses the internal proxy, and the internal proxy addresses the caching name server, and he gets out. Which basically means, which basically means that while well, we have to make exceptions, uh, we need intermediate servers to get out. Uh, this is not in the spirit of IETF, by the way. IETF wants Internet of Things and everything can talk to everything. So my refrigerator can talk to your refrigerator. But this is not, about, uh, this is not in the spirit of IETF. And I don't know about here, uh, but uh, sometimes explicit, explicit proxies are not well regarded upon. Uh, so a lot of people actually throw out they, their explicit proxy and replace them by some transparent proxy on the next generation firewall. So this is about the, the controversial part that people don't like this solution. But uh, in my opinion, if there is no explicit proxy in your company network, public DNS resolving is possible and you're open for everything. If, because the explicit proxy allows you to reorganize your DNS. Don't turn it away or the other way around. If there, is a DNA, if there is an explicit proxy, then I'm safe. No, no. An explicit proxy is a requirement for you to change the DNS flow in order to stop this. Okay, that's, that's it. There are some workshops where we look into the A records and hopefully there the, the uh, upload and download will succeed. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you.